Hi everybody and welcome to another special edition of the Titanic um, special on the Social Wave Project podcast. And today I have a pleasant and huge honour of talking to a relative of a Titanic survivor. However, not only we're going to be talking about her story, but we're going to be talking about the family history as well. And we are with David Hazeman. So David, hello, welcome. Uh, good morning to you. Pleased to meet you. And um, so have I got your surname right at all, David? Yes, Hazeman, yes, that's right, yep. Oh, brilliant, because I was just a bit worried I like how to pronounce it, but uh, like I got it right, yay! <laughs> Hazeman so, is right, yeah. yeah. So, some, people say, some people say Heisman, but it's not Heisman, it's Hazeman. Uh, uh, that, that all sounds a little bit confusing, because is the surname German or is it Dutch? Well, I think it it hails somewhere from a Europe, definitely. Um, it was also uh, brought up again from Czechoslovakia to Belgium over a few hundred years. And then it got as far as the uh, eastern part of, of England. And it came across from, from Belgium, across the channel to, to uh, Kent. There, there's quite a few Hazemans in Kent. And then it moved on to Canada and they're tied in with the Campbells in Canada. So that's about as much as I know about it. But it's, uh, I think it hails from uh, Europe at one time. Yeah, certainly. That's pretty fascinating history. I, I mean, I, I, to me, a Heisman sounds like a very unique name, but I, I just didn't really know it at the time. So that is pretty, pretty good. But um, we're going to probably jump on uh, to a little bit of your story, David. So, David, um, from what I understand, your mother was a survivor of the Titanic disaster, but she wasn't called Heisman at the time, but her surname was Brown. That's right, yeah. Her father, Thomas Brown, who was a, a, quite a wealthy fellow, actually. He was a Freemason as well in those days. And he was married once before, before he married Elizabeth, which is my, my mother's mother. And she was quite a wealthy woman. She came from a family in South Africa who had dairy interests and so on. And they had quite a bit of money behind them. Uh, mother was born in the uh, Masonic Hotel in Worcester in the Cape Province. And it was her father's hotel, the Masonic Hotel. And he had shares in wine and brandy companies. And she was uh, educated in a convent for a time, taught to be a lady how to walk properly, her department, and one thing and another. And she was a lady, without a doubt. Well, while they were in um, uh, the, the time of that particular time, they were there, they had a lot of trouble with uh, the Boers and so on. And they decided to move down to Durban and, and further on into Cape Town. An interest in Cape Town, it was called the Mountain View Hotel. And uh, she furthered her convent ed education there. And she spent most of her teenage time very close to her mother. Because in those days, young girls of that age of 14, 15, never left mother's side. You know, it's different today, but that's how it was then. And she helped mother in the hotel arranging flowers and doing things around the hotel for quite some some time. They um, had an aunt, Josephine, in, uh, in America, in Canada rather, who they corresponded with quite often. And Thomas was on about going to Canada. He thought the best thing would be to uh, explore it further for his hotel interests and so on. And his mind was finally made up in 1911 that they would do the voyage across to England and join that beautiful modern ship being built called the Titanic. 
So he made his booking there in Cape Town and they went on a ship called the Saxon from Cape Town to Southampton. Now the Saxon wasn't a strange ship to them because they'd been on several times before when they visited London to shop. All the stuff in London at that time was top quality and they bought clothes in Bond Street and places like that and then went back to South Africa. That's how their life was in those days. Oh, wow. So they, um, they stayed in the, uh, the hotel in London was the, um, oh, the Russell Hotel, London. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that hotel, yeah. Yeah, that, that, they stayed in there for a spell. And they shopped around Bond Street and places like that before they joined the train and went down to Southampton to join the Titanic. Well, that's how the story went. And of course, from there on, they enjoyed every bit of it for the start. Going up the gangway, Thomas came over very strange. He felt faint. And in those days, people were a bit very much into religious things and signs and omens. And his mother said, perhaps that's an omen, you know, don't worry about it. He said, I just felt strange, that's all. I think it was from too much brandy he'd drunk, but you never know. <laughs> I'm only joking there. He, he, was never, he was never a drunkard. But um, years later, mother always said that was a bad omen. So th that's what they believe, you see. Anyway, yeah. they joined, oh, they joined the ship in the... Uh, in the second class and um, they were very pleased with accommodation, very pleased with it until uh, the two women shared a cabin and Thomas shared a cabin with another gentleman. I have been on a lot of ships before because we used to come over from South Africa every year. My mother used to buy all her clothes in Bond Street, London and we used to go back to South Africa. I've been on ships before, but not one as beautiful as that. It's really a floating palace. It was really beautiful. The um, oil paintings alone was magnificent. And the carpets and the cutlery that's on the table, real silver, beautiful stuff. It was really a floating palace. And during the first few days after they visited North, uh, Ireland and Queenstown and then went on from there towards New York. New York. They um, took up a friendship with the Reverend Carter and his wife Lillian that was on their same dining table. And they got on very well. They were always chatting away in the smoking room. There was gossip on board about a fire in the bunkers. And this is not an unusual event on, on coal burning ships. It's um, when they load ships with coal, there's a great deal of uh, friction involved. And sometimes a spark can come from that. And atomized coal dust is very explosive. And this can cause a fire. But that's not uncommon. They would hose it down as it goes into bunkers. And uh, sometimes it would start again. But that's all they did during the voyage is hose it down. And the water would go down into the slop tanks and the bilges and then be pumped out to sea. Dirty water. But oh. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't do that today, yeah. as you know. No, yeah. that, that must have sounded pretty, pretty disgusting, really, <laughs> with all, all that. And probably hard work as well. Well, especially. it was what, what you talk term is slurry you know it's uh, from coal dust and water it'd be slurry you know but it, it's mucky anyway and um there was talk about that and people were saying i believe there's a fire on board and all this and other but of course it wasn't that dangerous as it's been made out to be it was quite common during the voyage uh, captain smith did his rounds now in those days it's quite normal it, they don't do it today because ships are so big, you know, and that. But in those days, the captain would always do his rounds and meet the passengers on deck in all the classes, even the third class. He'd pop down there and have a chat with them. Oh, I didn't so, know this. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's how they were. It was to keep the com company in good 
good esteem and it was a good good advert for him as well and he spoke to Thomas and he said are you enjoying the voyage and so on and my mother said to him have you got dogs on board he said I believe we've got a couple on the dog deck and she said to him have you got a dog captain he said yes I've got one home back in Southampton Captain Smith he said oh yeah fine he turned he was quite a nice chap to chat to as she said as mother told us but as the ice warnings came in during the the late later part of the voyage there is always a come through on on the, the radio from other ships really because radio was still in its infancy and ship to you know ships to ship radio was easier than ship to shore radio and uh, they were saying there's ice in the region and they just said well yes we've heard there's ice around but no one took much notice of it but um one of the things with an iceberg it's it can be thousand a uh, pack of ice it can be thousands of years old and it could have all kinds of bird droppings on it and rubbish and so on from birds and what have you. And old seamen used to say, you can smell these birds when they're in the area. Well, whether that was the case with Titanic or not, it's something else. But of course, they never took much notice of it. And on the night in question, things were normal. And um, I was a lookout with Canard White Star as a seaman. I was a paid lookout. They were the only shipping company in the Merchant Navy that paid lookouts because of the Titanic disaster. And I used to get extra money for that. And I used to go up inside the mast. It was hollow, you know, inside. There's a ladder upstairs, like a tube. And when you're up there, you're in a different world. In thick sea line, sea lane fog, you're in sunshine and you can't see the ship below you. That's how it is sometimes. But um, on those occasions when there's ice to be in the area, they usually double up on lookouts. And they also have, when I was at sea, they had what they called an ice routine. That was the closing of ports and deadlights and, of course, watertight doors. The watertight doors can be operated from the bridge, but all the ports and deadlights have to be shut. Well, whether there was an ice routine operated on Titanic to that degree is quite, you know, quite extraordinary, really. But um, what they did do is they doubled up on lookouts. Now, in my day, we always put a lookout on the focal head and one up the mast. Because when you're up the mast, you can see far further than you can on the folks' head. But the Board of Trade always states we must have two in, in fog or in ice routine situations. Well, they had two up the mast, hardly any room to move up there. Freezing cold, wearing whatever clothes they could because they were quite poor seamen were in those days and had none of these heavy duffel coats and things. So they would be wrapped up and be even put blankets around themselves to keep warm up there and they had to do a two hour stunt. So with that and eyes watering and very little protection up there, they actually had the situation where they had a shroud of fog and some ice in the vicinity and suddenly an iceberg was spotted. Now in those days with the ship steaming at 21 knots, which is quite fast, is about 20, 23 miles an hour, with the ship steaming at that uh, speed, you have to have the notice beforehand to stop the ship. When you have an emergency stop, that's the same, but it's, it takes longer. Now, normally, the captain would put the ship on standby if he thinks there's ice in the region or an iceberg around put her on standby. And when you put a ship on standby, the revolutions are slowed down slightly. So instead of going at top speed, you're still going at a good rate, but less so. That might not have happened with Titanic. When they said iceberg ahead, time was of the essence, it really was. They would have had to notify the engine room after they realized there was an iceberg dead ahead. That takes several seconds. 
and you're still traveling at 23 knots, 22 knots, tell the engine room. Engine room down below, always on a ship when it's steaming well, the engineer is not necessarily on the throttles. They're usually around doing jobs in the engine room all over. They don't actually stay by the throttles all the way. The ship's run itself. So there, the first thing when they get that alarm bell, stop, full of stern, becomes a disbelief. More valuable seconds are wasted. Then they have to get in position, find out, is this right? Is this true? What's happening? Turn these huge wheels to divert the steam. And all of this time, the ship is still going ahead at 21 knots. So its impact with the iceberg is massive. I always quite wonder, um, as the story goes, your grandfather, Thomas, um, he got um, your grandmother and your mother, Edith, to um, get up from their beds and he went to check to see what's happening. Did they oh, yeah. actually feel the ice ba um, iceberg impact at all? Well, he said to them when he, he knocked on their door, he said, oh, first of all, he just warned them. He said, there's talk that there's ship has struck an iceberg but i'll go up top and see what i can find out and then later about five ten minutes later he said you'd better come on deck and put all your warm clothes on everyone's assembling up on deck and the stewards then were going around the alleyways banging the doors saying everybody up want you up top got to get upstairs just in case again it still wasn't thought that the ship was going to sink they thought it was an emergency but as always, they would go back to bed later and it'll all be over. That's what they thought, but not so. Of course, when they finally got up, up there on deck, they found so many people up, several flights of stairs, so many people up there, standing around, saying, we'll be glad when this is all over so we can go back down to bed again, puffing on cigarettes and walking around in circles and. Nobody was not really understanding that the ship was in a critical situation and the, the forward sections were flooding with water. The Reverend Carter, this is quite a strange little story that goes with that. The Reverend Carter helped Thomas to put mother and her daughter in the lifeboat. And then he said, I'll go back and attend to Lillian, his wife, who's destined for another lifeboat. He must have done that. But at the end of it all in New York, when they got the passenger survivors list out, Lillian was a the survivor. So did she climb out of the boat again to be with her husband? Because he went down. So it's quite something else, isn't it? Mm. Just another story within hundreds of stories. It could have it's sunk in one piece, or it's possible that it could have broken half because one half was flooded and the other half was sticking up in the air and the strain, the strain on the ship's timbers or her keel would have, to such an extent, she could have broken in half. But the way she laid on the ocean floor um, was in two separate pieces. So perhaps she did break on the way down, I, I would imagine. But um, I, I, I would think that could be the case, that she could have broken half on the way down, yeah. Oh, okay. That, that's really interesting. I've never heard of this before. But, yeah, yeah that's a it, definitely interesting theory. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, most ships just don't break in half. You know, they're built to take on heavy weather. When, when a ship is in heavy weather, I'll do this very quickly for you. When a ship is in heavy weather, Head on sea, a long ship, a thousand feet in length, a big wave at the front, and a big wave at the stern, and the middle's not supported. And there's a weakness, but it would in fact break if it wasn't properly built. So, so you see what I'm saying? There is, it becomes a certain part of the ship for only a second or two that's not supported at all in heavy weather, but it doesn't crack open. Another thing to ponder when they say it broke in half. I've often had my doubts about it, but I never found the wreck on the bottom of the ocean, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, that, that's definitely a mystery. And it's something I never, ever actually heard before. But that that is really, really interesting. But then we, 
we come up to a really sad part within the story because as everyone knows that um the car Tha uh, car savior a uh, car savior i hopefully i got this right because i can never I'll pronounce it, it yeah yes that's it um then the, the ship actually picked up the survivors but this is heartbreaking every time i think about this but when i read the story your mother actually um hoped that um thomas was still alive and every time she yeah. would see a lifeboat she would just run to the railings searching for him yeah, yeah. and she didn't know about uh, thomas's fate until they reached new york yeah they went around the hospitals in new york to see if he'd been rescued um but captain roster and he used to live just up around the road here for me oh really he Oh yeah, I, I, his grave is just at the back here. I've seen I've seen it many times. I mean, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? It's it's worth remembering that. <laughs> wow. But uh, I've been to his house, which is up there. That's uh, well half a mile up there, and had dinner up there in his his house, Captain Robson's house, and he's had. He's never forgotten his nautical side of things. The front of his garden is like the bow of a ship. And he's got brass rope as handrails going up the stairs. So he's never forgotten the sea, even when he was home in Chalk Hill. That's what's called Chalk Hill, just up there. It's where he used to live. And it's a, it's a registered house now. It's got a plaque on it. So people know who, it, who used to live there, you know. But old Rosser and then his wife, yeah, she's buried in the same gra grave with him, Captain Rosser. Oh, that that's really extraordinary. And mm. uh, of course, we know a little bit that um, when Edith survived and that she met um, your dad, um, they knew each other through Robert Hitchens. That's right. Yeah, in in Johannesburg, my father was a young draftsman. He'd gone out to South Africa with his own father. Some after he's he's uh, left he's left his wife behind. I don't know. I've never gone into that. But I, <laughs> I think there was a bit of a falling out there. Some, but anyhow, he went to South Africa with his own father. It was a great bit of a yachtsman. His father, his grandfather was, but Dad was a draftsman, and he was always wanted to go to sea, but he was wouldn't let him. He said, "You take up your apprenticeship as." a draftsman that's where you'll go further so he decided after he heard that the titanic had sunk there was a, a newspaper in johannesburg their major newspaper i've got a cut near it i can't have got it now but they were offering a prize for someone who could come up with an idea of safety at sea with the titanic in mind and my dad drew a diagram with lifeboats coming out the ship side and on off the top deck, because coming off the top deck was further dropped to the sea, but they were coming out of the ship side, which they do today. If you look at big liners today, they come out of the ship side, the lower decks, not up the top, and he won a prize. And the person who was interested in his piece that he read in the paper was Bob Hitchens, who actually took it up and they became friends. And uh, he was a quartermaster on t the Titanic, as you know. Yeah, uh, that, that's really fascinating how they ha had this connection. And yeah. it seems to me, though, that um, there was lots of Titanic connections in the family, but then also in um, the Navy as well, because um, after um, you were born and then after your siblings were born as well, I believe there was about two or three of your siblings as well as yourself joining the na navy uh all of us well my my brothers i got um seven brothers and two sisters and four of them were in the royal navy one in the merchant navy and me in the merchant navy the other in the air force and um they all did, did 12 years 10 years in the royal navy yes yeah, quite a naval family really royal naval family but to me and Leo were in the Mercy Navy, and he had quite a career up there in the in the ice up and helping the Russians and God knows what during the war, you know, with uh, convoys up there. Yeah, it's quite a bit. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. And then before the interview as well, you mentioned to me about um, during your time going um, to sea um, on the waters towards Canada. And at some point during your time, you um, went past um, the Titanic um, and that was before the wreck was discovered. What made you feel that well, during the time that you were sailing on the different ships, what was going through your mind every time you thought of the Titanic um, when it was in its position after the sinking? Well, we just realised that what it was, to me, as a seaman, it's a sunken ship, merchant navy ship. And to, to my way of thinking, of course, to my mother's way of thinking as well, it's a gravesite should be left alone. Now, I remember saying to my mother, when they found the Titanic, I went up to her flat, she was half asleep in her armchair, and I said, Mother, they found the Titanic. And the exact words she said was, never. Oh, really? Yeah, I said, yes, I have. The next words she said was, what on earth are they going to do with it? And then I said to her, they can't do anything by the mother, it's too deep. And then she said, that's good then, that's my father's grave. Now that's as it's always been. And we look upon that as a grave site. So it's the same if I go to the cemetery. I don't fiddle with other people's graves. But now they've picked it clean, it should be left alone. Yeah, definitely, it should be left alone. But then of course as well, um, with people, um... Uh, like oh, what what was the one examples um picking the artifacts um from the wreck itself um such as um oh what was the one example um pairs of shoes um a doll yeah the, all the of french that. the french got a lot of that they got suitcases out of that ship brought them up don't know where they are must be all over france probably in exhibitions but the thing is the uh, to to really plunder the wreck, which it is, it's been done for money. They say it's for history. Well, if you want a piece of a ship that looks like the Titanic, you've only got to go into the Mediterranean and pick and dive on the Britannic. She's a sister ship in shallow water. The same gear is there. The same radio op operation is there. Everything on board that ship is identical to Titanic. But no, they've gone to the Titanic, which means they've made it a big story and they plundered direct for money. Mm. Pure and simple. So all of those dives on the Titanic cost millions of dollars. The preparation. Who's paying for that? Who wants the return on that? Who's going to have to pay to go into an exhibition to view these things? It's going to be for money. It can be for history. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, every time I... Oh, what was this um, one example? Um, I, I always, like... When I visit like exhibitions or museums about the Titanic, I always think of one thing. And the one example of this I can remember, when I was 15, I went um, to one of the exhibitions in London. And I can remember that in one section, when they were talking about um, the wreck itself, in a glass case, there was a piece of one of the Titanic's hole and I think it was the big piece and the fall of the big piece is now in Orlando in America and they were encouraging um, some uh, visitors at the time to touch it but of course with Covid now you can't. When I touched it I can remember that shivering feeling down my spine and I thought to myself this is unbelievable and I don't know if if it's true or if it's false but that shiver said to me really don't touch me do not touch me at all I am more than just um part of history just yeah. don't touch me and I never forgot that no it's uh, it's amazing how people feel about it it's um you know I always think with people who have relations that died on there I went to see with quite a few blokes who had relatives on there in the crew but they didn't 
go on about it. It's just that it was a bad luck job. You know, they didn't make a thing of it, but, uh, you know, Poindestras and people like that. But they were on all canard ships out of Southampton years ago, odds and ends of seamen who, used, who had relatives on there and fellow seamen, friends of theirs, and uncles and aunts and uncles and granddads on there. They didn't make a meal of it. It was, to them, it was an unfortunate and terrible disaster. And it was left there for that. That's how people treated it. But it's only this film that's come out that's blown everything out of proportion to such a degree that it's now a money spinner. That's what it is. We know all about the history. We know all about it. We want to see what the radio room looks like. Marconi's got pictures of it. Mm. You know? Yes, I, I think... I said this into a um, past episode before, but I read a newspaper not too long ago that um, I think one of the American companies was thinking about raising um, some part of the Maconi room, but the you, the British government said, no, we don't really want that. But of course, that ex uh, expedition was banned due to COVID. But mm. in, uh, I, I thought that was a massive shock. Well, that is, I could tell you something that might interest you as well. Oh, yeah. Did you see the film Titanic? Oh, the James Cameron one? Yeah. Oh, oh yes, I've seen it plenty of times. Right. When it starts, there's a survey vessel over the wreck site, isn't there? Yes. Right. In 1976, uh, I think, they had a, a Titanic um, remembrance a voyage to the Titanic wreck site on the ship called the Ocean Breeze. Mother was invited to go on this ship to the Titanic wreck site with my sister. And they went. And mother's photographed in a wheelchair on the ship over the wreck site, dropping a wreath on the water. Who do you think got their idea of a mother and a daughter arriving at the wreck site? from a helicopter this time. That sounds like That's it must really got the story, wasn't it? Oh, oh yes, definitely. That was um, at the beginning of the scene yeah. uh, with um, Rose and her granddaughter. Yeah, uh, and of course, right. yeah, and of course, Gloria uh, Stewart was um, like, she, she must have felt like in some sense, really, she must yeah. have been in Edith's position. Well, Cameron knows that because he met the family. He met Dorothy and my mother. Oh, really? That's where he got the idea from. Oh, wow. I did not know this at all. No, he's, he's never said a lot about it because it's going to cost him some money if he does. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's really fascinating because um, it, it was just something that anyone didn't really know about. But of, of course, as well, um, everyone said that James Cameron uh, really did a good job of the Titanic. So I have a little bit of criticism with that. Dramatization of the film spoiled it to, to one extent. But, um, you know, people wading around in water, which is below freezing, yeah, it's one degree below. You can't, once you're in water like that, you've got to wait three or four minutes if you're lucky. You don't wade around decks and things like that. It's too cold. You try it. <laughs> Go up to the North Pole and try it. Oh, 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 definitely not really, not for me, but um, I, I know that, um, what, what was it that Charles Lightoller said? Um, if you go in the water, it was like a thousand knives driven in one's body. Well, they do, they say, what, what they do, in fact, is they, they usually give you four minutes before your body begins to shut down, don't they? You know, there's that little bit of uh, adrenaline that kicks in and to keep you alive. And then after about four minutes, it gives up. And it only happens in children sometimes where they can last a little bit longer. They sort of have the resilience to do that. But most people, they, after four, four minutes, it's uh, really curtains if you're not dragging out the water, you know. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I mean, that, that's just, it sounds like it was a shock. And then um, when you think of children, babies, the, the most really, on the most tragic, oh, yeah, because yeah. They, they can't swim. And no, the, there was a few babies that did die from exposure um, after oh, yeah, the ship yeah. went down, which is just heartbreaking. 
oh yeah, he'd done a good job, and you know, as a as a uh, f for a dramatic movie, he's done a good job. But when it comes to truth, I mean, the officer who shot himself, it didn't happen. He paid compensation to the, the family for that. That didn't happen. You know, it's it's sort of they're not like that. Seamen are not like that. They'll stay there and help as much as they can. They're not going to commit suicide. But there you are. He got a film and he made money. Lots of it. And then also we've got to think about um, with the conclusion of this, um, with the Titanic, because uh, everyone knows really that um, because of the bacteria in the sea, the Titanic is slowly disappearing. And a lot of people are debating about how the wreck is going to last. But for me, um, it, it will be gone within five to ten years. Um, and especially because um, with all um, the ex uh, not, not expedition, the expedition dives, um, the ship is disappearing um, much quicker. And um, with all some parts that have gone already, it's just um, heartbreaking. But it's understandable because nature does claim uh, things as her oh, own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all of that will eventually, especially under that pressure as well. It will eventually disappear and leave just a, a big pile of dust there, I expect. But um, that is the history of it. And uh, as a ship, it made more money as a wreck than it did if it carried out its 32-year sea career as a passenger carrying vessel. It's just so heartbreaking because it, it is always going to be debatable with this. Oh, yeah. And when it's gone, um, it, it's people are going to question it. That um, it, is it going to be gone uh, historically, or it's going to be gone as part of a grave site, and it should be treated with full respect. Well, it should be. They, I mean, there are quite a lot of wartime ships during the war. There's uh, ships that have sunk with thousands on board warships, you know, and sometimes they. they certain societies they, they run a ship out there and they throw a reef on the water you know and that sort of thing is what should be done for the titanic but keep diving down and picking bits off of there no not really not really i don't think so i believe what mother said it should be left alone and that's it oh, i definitely agree with edith there but then um i'm gonna probably finish uh, this with one final question and this is um a question that i've always told um everyone who i've interviewed so so far how do you think the Titanic sh uh, should be remembered once it's gone? Um, I would say a disastrous wreck, definitely, with a great loss of lives. And it was one of the unknowns of Mother Nature. Mother Nature won. You know, she won because that ice floating down the, from the Labrador Straits came down early that year because of the warmer weather. And if it hadn't been for that, she may have reached New York, one freak iceberg. So you could say one, one iceberg changed history. Just one iceberg changed so many people's lives. I don't know how you want to term that, but that's what it was. Um, that's definitely something that I definitely agree with, especially um, uh, some people um, would say that nature is very important, especially during this time. It's always going to be this way and yeah. nature will always um, keep fighting uh, humans no matter what. Well, you have to remember the same way the Titanic, have to, you have to remember it the same way as that iceberg. That iceberg would have gone on, drifted south and eventually disappeared and became part of the sea. That's it. Yeah. And that's what the Titanic did. Became a part of the sea. It's mm. the best way I can think of it. Oh, oh no, that, that's just uh, definitely um, uh, enough said really about all of this, because it does make you think uh, about how haunting it could be, but also it's a life lesson. Yeah, yeah. And we have to be more aware of what nature can do and with global warming, we've got it all to come. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's really scary once everyone thinks about it, but hopefully in time really with everything that's going on, um, humans will probably understand um, what can be done in the future. And But if 
people can't really think of uh, anything like that in the past it's always important just to um, do something in the present before um, trying to save the future with um, out worrying about it too much yeah yeah so do you know to to, to add it all up really all I can say is a disastrous wreck we learned many lessons and it should be left alone that's all I can say on it Oh, that, yeah. that's actually a good word to say. And um, we're going to end it right here. David, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure to uh, chat with you about your mother's story and um, your career and everything. And yeah, I I hope uh, that, I don't know what else to say about that I'm really. Sorry. Uh, no, my mind's it's... completely blown after all of this. Oh, yes, so, well, it's been lovely meeting you. It says, it says, it says. Uh, it says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always difficult to pronounce really but it, it, it's always all right but thank you so much david it's, it's, it's been, been lovely talking to you yeah um, all right then bye-bye yeah. for now then bye-bye <laughs>